where you come from, it's alright, yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter where you come from, it's alright, yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter where you come from, it's alright, I came up from the bottom of a bottle with rebels and desperados, it was long days and hard nights, but I had to struggle for my dream, cause nobody else could see it. No one to turn to somebody With just a little faith There's nothing I can achieve Yeah, I was going If I could be anybody I wanna be me Yeah, I just wanna be So I'm John Halbert Up here in Aroostook County Little old Caribou, Maine I'm born and raised And I recover loud Hi everyone Welcome to Recover Loud Presented to you by Recovery on the Road In our small hometown in northern Maine we had never heard anyone talk about recovery. The recovery programs were as much a mystery to me as the Freemasons. I didn't know anybody in recovery. I didn't know where any of the meetings were, and I didn't know how to become a member. Today, we recover loud so that no one has to wonder if recovery is possible. Hi, I'm Mike, and I'm grateful to be in recovery. Today, I get to be a father, a husband, a son, a brother, and a friend. I'm a college student studying criminal justice online. I currently work as a registered Maine peer recovery coach, as well as sitting on the board of directors for a local nonprofit. I'm the co-founder of Recovery on the Road and co-creator of this show, Recover Loud. You can read my personal story in the book, God Loves Addicts Too, as well as in the latest issue of Journey Magazine. Welcome back to Recover Loud, uh, presented by Recovery on the Road. We're here tonight with John Hollabird from Caribou. Welcome, John. Glad to see you. Uh, so, John, uh, we knew each other way back when, um, you know, when things were still a mess. And uh, then one day I came to the Redemption Center and I saw you working and you said, I'm in recovery. And I kind of smirked. And uh, <laughs> I left that day and, and it didn't really register. Um, but you were the first one in, in Caribou to ever mention recovery to me. Uh, and I thank you for that. Um, so how did you get to that point that day at the Redemption Center when I saw you? Um, what, what happened leading up to that point? Well, there's a lot there. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I've been addicted since 12 or 13 years old. And before that, I even, I even showed a bunch of addicted, addictive personalities. You know, I was always a center of attention, not comfortable in my own skin, looking for attention from people. I didn't, it wasn't healthy, um, all that stuff. Um, you know, in high school, I was always the, the center of attention, you know, usually end up in my underwear on top of a hood of a car, you know, yeah. hollering to some ACDC somewhere out in the yeah. field somewhere. Um, you know, that's who I was. I, I thrived on that reputation of a badass. And I really wasn't. I was, I was uh, a really uh, soft hearted mm -hmm. feller, but, you know, I hardened my heart for a lot of years. Um, so, you know, going fast forward and through, through high school, middle school, I overdosed in sixth grade for the first time on uh course eating uh, ended up in the hospital stomach pump the whole nine yards uh that was like 13 or 14 years old you know so i rolled with that reputation for you know my whole life i come out in the streets of caribou trying to be an adult uh you know got a girl pregnant thought i would do the right thing white picket fence the whole nine yards bought a house um end up still using the whole time you know and then and then once he was born the pressure was on and and my using took off because i couldn't handle the pressure really um I was still trying to fit in where I didn't belong. Um, so I got wire. I, the, the, the DEA set me up on a wire by twice in, in two days. Once was in a school zone. So uh, I got a class A, a class B, um, got bailed out. My parents bailed me out. Um, I, I ran the roads for like another eight months, but my case was coming up soon. I needed a lawyer. I thought I'd, you know, go make one more spin and, and, and fund a lawyer. Um, I ended up down in Bangor with a couple that, I met that was, you know, getting a load in and I was going to bring it up north and, and make my coin. And um, I end up with a, you know, non-registered, uninsured, uninspected, headlight out, borrowed a car from some woman, promised her this, promised her that when I got back, got the car, went down there. Um, of course, I made it down there fine, got to the place I was going, filled the trunk full of dope and guns and pulled out of there. And, you know, I didn't make another two blocks after that once I was loaded up and the blue lights came on, but. 
to me, that's God's grace. Today, I can recognize that as God's grace because, you know, the blue lights are the, the final kicker that saved my life. Um, I ended up in Penobscot County Jail. Um, I did about eight months. And I also had the charges up here in the county. So I was kind of jumping back and forth, but Penobscot had some kind of legality rule or technicality thing. They wouldn't furlough for, uh, for rehabs. So I was trying to get into Lewiston, the St. Francis house. I had been there once before in 2015 and uh, I knew it was a good program. I knew, I knew they really cared about the people. They really wanted to see them clean and that's where I wanted to be. So um, I ended up in the cell, you know, wanting to get out, driving myself nuts in these walls. Um, a kid comes in and out, in and out, in and out. And I said, dude, how'd you, you know, how the hell are you getting out of here? You know, I'm coming back like that. He's like, I'll fill out a request form, go see the chaplain. I'm like, I didn't even know what a chaplain was, dude. I really didn't even know the definition of it, but I didn't give a shit. I just wanted out of that room. So I filled out the request form and I probably even asked him how to spell chaplain. Um, so a couple hours later, they says, uh, Holliver chaplain. I'm like, all right, I don't know where I'm going or what I'm going to do, but let's go do it. So I walked down and I ended up walking in the room, guys holding a Bible. I'm like, oh shit, <laughs> you know, shit's getting real now. <laughs> this guy's got the good book, you know? Right. So he, uh, you know, I tell them a little bit about my story. Of course, I was 119 pounds. I had a, you know, 50, 50 cent piece sore on my face, uh, long hair, dripping sweat. Oh, dude, it was a disaster. I was a complete wreck. And uh, actually, my lawyer wouldn't even show me the police video of my arrest because he said, you'll never, you'll never outlive it. You know what I mean? You'll never live outlive that shame because I was just a wreck, yelling, swearing, hitting my head off the window. It was just a disaster. Not who I was, you know? Right. And so the chaplain read me a verse called James 1.8, and it said a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And I never related that to God. I wasn't even thinking about God or Jesus at the time. You know, I just remember hearing double-minded and thinking, wow, dude, that's what's got me. That's what's kept me used in this whole time. You know, I'm, I've always had one foot in and one foot out, you know, and, and this time, if I really want change, I'm going to have to have both feet in on the good side. You know, I'm going to have to have both foot in on the clean side. There ain't no hitting a joint. There ain't no sipping a Budweiser. There ain't no nothing for me. Cause I know where it ends up. It's the weirdest thing. I drink a beer. Next thing you know, I'm in the parking lot snorting meth. I don't know how it works, but it works like that. So, you know, I, I got out of there and started doing the AA anything, surrounded myself by a really good group, you know, surrounded myself with winners. And, and, and I took off, man. I just started thriving for recovery. I started seeing people get healthy and, you know, I was just loving every minute of it. So I stuck with it, man. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we're all grateful that you did, that you did. Um, so what, what kinds of things are you doing today for the recovery community uh, in care? So, so today, you know what I mean? My, I don't know. I feel like the most important role I play is an open phone line. I mean, anybody that's, that's sick or struggling, they know that I'm, you know, I'm pretty laid back. They can call me with a needle in their arm and I'm not going to say you're a junkie with a needle in your arm. You know what I mean? I'm going to say, what are we going to do to get that needle out of your arm forever? You know, what's, what's the first baby step you need to take to make yourself right with yourself in order to feel worth it, you know what I mean? Because because that's what it is. You don't feel worth it. You don't feel like there's no door out. There's no, you know, you're stuck in the four walls and you'll never get out. Well, listen, I'm here to tell you there's a way out. And, and if, you know, if, if it takes you being drugged by me and that's what you want, I'm willing to drag you. But, you know, you get a call, you get to reach out, you know. So I'm an open phone line for anybody that wants to call. Um, I'm also a chair of a grassroots community group called a Recovery Rustic. Um, what we do is is we try to add resources or advertise resources. We set up tables at like the uh, Thursday night on Sweden streets. It's like a, a street dance thing. We do craft fairs. We do whatever organization will allow us to come in with the word recovery on it. You know, um, yeah. I'm uh, also in, very involved with uh, opening the, the sober houses. My father-in-law's, well, my wife is, is also in recovery. And my father-in-law is really passionate about it because he watched his daughter walk through it. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, let's open some houses. So we, we started thinking and beating around the idea. So we ended up buying this old condemned house and remodeling it, open the men's house. The demand was so great, dude. I mean, it was a revolving door at first. We had a lot of people in and out, relapse in and out, in and out. But we knew that that need was there. So, uh, you know, our next our next ambition was to open a female house. And, and we've talked ambitions about a, a detox up here because, you know, there's a hundred plus sober houses in the state of Maine and we had nothing in Arusa County. And I mean, nothing, dude. Um, we had people like fighting us about zoning laws and everything else to, to even get a recovery house. And, and, you know, it's pretty ridiculous that these people don't even want to see these people get better. It's, it's like, they just wanted to write them off. 
So we ended up, you know, battling a few, few little, little battles, but we're on the upside now, man. We're starting to build some stuff. We got a recovery center through AMHC and um, we got, you know, a men's house open. It's full capacity right now. Um, we just opened a women's house there not too long ago. They, they get a couple of people that are taking more clients at the first of the year. We still got some renovations to do. So, but yeah, man, we're on our way. We could, we could definitely get a long ways to go, but we're working at it, chipping away at it. Yeah, that that's great stuff. Um, that women's house. Did you tell me, do they accept women with children? Um, right now we're not, we're not at that capability right now, but after the renovations are complete, I do believe we'll have one suite that'll, uh, allow the women and the child with, with the woman and the child, we're trying to keep them completely separate from the other house, not isolated, but you know, we don't want the other, the other tenants around the child, depending on what the mother wants the child exposed to, you know right. what I mean? So it's, it's a touchy area, but yes, we're definitely shooting to be able to have a, a mother and child or, or women and kids there. Yes. You know, yeah. that's one hoop, that's one hoop a mother would have to jump through and, and try to de-shame herself, you know, with, without her kids, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's another term of her life that she's got to live clean with no kids. That ain't right, man. So let's, let's all recover together. You know, let's see the whole family recover together, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, as, as addicts, we see, we see a lot of uh, barriers to recovery, you know, that's it. We, yep. we, need find, we need to find the right time. You know, we need to make sure that we've got things lined up. We've got to make sure that our our kids are taken care of, our pets are taken care of. Um, you know, yeah. we always have excuses why we can't recover. Um, what are some of the yeah. barriers that you've seen up in the county? Um, like I said, when I first got sober, dude, there was nothing but barriers. You know, you know, honesty was actually a real killer back then. As soon as you got honest, that's when the stigma set in and, and nobody really wanted to help you. I could have said I was a psychiatric patient and I probably would have had help. But if I would have said I was, you know, addicted to basalt and methamphetamine, I was just a low life that they were willing to write off. But I mean, a lot of that's changed. We got a lot of, we, we do have some resources now. I mean, AMHC's opened up a lot. Um, we got the recovery center. We got recovery of Roostick. And, and more or less, we got a, a group of people that's willing to listen. We got a group of people that's willing to, you know what I mean, buy you a phone card so you can have a phone to reach out. We got, you know, a lot of church groups, man, I'm, I'm part of this Fortress Church group. They're willing to, to get boots on the ground and help out. The Caribou Assembly of God's been doing a lot of donational stuff, resource stuff. They get a van. We've been picking people up. Um, you know, as far as barriers today, I still I still see some stigma. I mean, there's still a lot of, uh, you know, there's a Caribou Citizens Outreach page that if you mention addiction on there, recovery, dude, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. It's, they say, oh, it's not a place for that. Well, it is a place for that because it's Caribou Citizens Outreach. I am a citizen of Caribou who needed outreach and, and I just didn't have it. But, you know, I, I think today, if I were to try to get sober again, it'd probably be a lot easier path, probably a lot less abrasive. But back when I did it in 2016, man, it was it wasn't happening. I had to be incarcerated. Yeah. And, you know, I actually I, I entered recovery in 2018 and, you know, I had those same barriers. You know, I didn't yeah. know any recovery. I didn't know where the meetings were held um, and, yeah. I, and I, I didn't know how to do it. Um, so I'm glad that you're doing something today to help bring people uh, to recovery. And by recovering loud, that's, that's what we do. Um, yeah. you know, people are aware of programs uh, that weren't there before. Um, I, I believe uh, in Presque Isle, they just opened up an, a methadone clinic. That's they did, yeah. yeah, a new clinic. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're, um, they're real busy. So it's, it's a good thing. Yeah, and you know we support all pathways to recovery. Um, yes, sir. Whether it's religious, whether it's twelve step, whether it's it's methadone, MAT, um, whatever it yeah. takes to get away from that substance that was killing us. You yeah. know, or um, all of the above, or, or all of the above. Yeah. And, yeah, it's, that's like for me when I when I talk to people, like I can kind of get a read on them, and like you know, I I, I don't try to judge them, but I can tell you, like, listen, my story is not going to do it for you, but my story and Mike's story might do it for you. Or, or my story, my story, his wife's story, my wife's story. You know, I might need nine of you guys, but yeah. by, by keeping my feelers out there and recovering loud and knowing people, knowing that I'm a part of that or, or me knowing you guys are a part of that, then listen, man, you know, we can, we can, you just power numbers, man. And, and with different resources, different paths that we did, you know, we can explain this path, that path, this path, this drug of choice, that drug of choice. You, you can kill that excuse and knock that excuse out because you know what I mean? We've all done it and this is how it is, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's that's the basis of recovering loud is, you know, just we didn't do anything special. 
Uh, you know, we're not special people because we get out. We found a way and we put in the work. And yep. Yep. You know, today, today we refuse to give up the life that we're building. Yeah, um, after like 14 months when I go home from jail, my parents want to throw me a party. And I'm like, I'm not coming home from Harvard. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It shouldn't be a party event, man. I just yep. want to come home and, and keep my head down and keep going the way I'm going. I start getting all crazy you know yeah end up at the dealer's house in no time no parties no parties for me <laughs> right. uh, so what, what kind of life have you built yourself today in recovery uh well currently i'm sitting in my son's bedroom he's uh, he's, he's with my parents tonight but um yeah i gotta my son's got his own bedroom you know that's that's one of the little things i would have never been able to accomplish um so I started out when I got out working for my brother at the Redemption Center, like you mentioned, and uh, he had owned another one. And he said, listen, man, you know, I, I got a baby on the way. My life's getting crazy. I don't really need two. He's like, if you want to put a five year plan down there, we can, you know, in five years, you know, we'll we'll see if we can't get you an owner. I said, all right. So after about two years, I was just, you know, beat up, making the same money. And, and I was starting to plateau with my recovery, you know, AA and NA was you know, it was all good. I was surrounded with a good network, but the anonymous thing was a killer for me. I like to be loud. I like to be, you know, I was proud of what I was doing. You know what I mean? And if I had to be anonymous, then nobody could know I was doing it. I couldn't help anybody. You know what I mean? So I felt restricted. I don't know. So anyways, I, I went to NMDC, Northern Main Development Committee, and uh, I pitched a gig and I pitched them my story is what I pitched them. I told them, you know, I told them right out front, this is where I'm at. I got multiple felonies. Um, a, a, a minimum wage job for me is not going to cut it because that's not where I want to be in life. You know what I mean? I'm looking to get married. Can't afford the wedding after marriage comes kids. Listen, I need money. I need a good career. So, you know, I need a few thousand dollars <clears throat> and, uh, believe it or not, man, they took a chance on me and they approved me for that loan. So my five-year plan ultimately turned into a two-year plan and, uh, I, I signed the paperwork last year and and uh so this first of this year I'll, I'll be a business owner for for the first year you know things are going good um money's good bill, bills are paid um i just had a daughter she was in the NICU for a little while she's she's now dude almost six months old 18 pounds healthy and loud just like her father um yeah. my 11 year old boy he's he's playing athletics dude he's he's a He's got some promise in athletics. He's a superstar athlete, super smart. Our grades are good. Um, you know, we hit some bumps in the roads because he was around for my whole addiction, you know, so there's some recovery still need to be made with him. But, uh, you know, for the most part, he looks up to me like God, dude. And, uh, you know, that's that's amazing. Um, you know, it's, besides that, it's just everyday things, man. Tonight I went out and snow blowed my driveway so my wife can get in and out of the house. Um, you know, my two nieces live with me, my sister-in-law. We all live together in a big old house, so it's a it's a tight knit family thing, you know. And um, it's 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 just it's an amazing life I live today. And it's it's the small things, man. It's the day to day stuff, you know. My son called me, Dad, can I go to the rec after school and play basketball? Um, you know, stuff like that. I, I was never I was never the guy to have any type of say in that. I, I I wasn't responsible enough to have any say in any of that stuff. Today I decide, you know what we're going to do for dinner. I mean, I decide what, you know, what bills we're going to pay this month and maybe hold off on next week. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's the little things, man. Yeah. We, we get to live the life that, you know, yep. we saved, you know, yep. uh, you know, uh, I always say that I'm building a life today that I don't want to give to the kid down the road because he doesn't yeah. deserve my life. You right. Know? Um, and, uh, you know, I want, I want to live this life. So, yeah. uh, that's, that's why I continue in recovery. Um, you know, and ending the stigma, um, you know, the reason I do that is so that I can go further, you know, yep. And if yep. I can do it for somebody else, you know, that that's the idea. So Listen, it ain't easy, man. I'm, I'm, you know, almost five years into this. And just last week, you know, some high school kid <clears throat> knew my reputation and, and approached my 11 year old kid and offered him some weed. And my kid said, you know, it's not cool to smoke weed. And the kid said, yeah, yeah, your dad's just a drug addict. You know what I mean? So he come home all upset. Dad, you got to do something about this. No, I don't have to do anything about that. You know what I mean? Because you know, Hayden, and I know, you know what I mean? I'm not a drug addict no more. That's not, that doesn't define me who I am. You know what I mean? Yeah, and, and, I, we do recover. And, uh, you know, it's good that your son can do that. Recovery is a family affair. Amen. Um, you know, uh, I raised my kids through my addiction. 
My yep. daughter was 16 before she ever met me sober. Um, yep. You know, and I'm proud today to be able to be, you know, present for them, just like you are for your kids. So, Amen, brother. You know, and, and that's the life. That's what we live for. Um, th- yep. This is the life we get to choose to live now. And, uh, you know, I'm proud of you for choosing recovery. Thank you for recovering loud and, you know, sharing hope for others in, in my old hometown. Hey, man, thanks for all you're doing down there. Not everyone can enjoy the holiday season. Family gatherings can often become toxic and cause even more trauma. Having an exit plan before you go out is a great way to avoid falling backwards. Here are a few things you can do if your safety is in jeopardy. You can always avoid the gathering altogether. Trust yourself. You know your limits. You can plan your reason ahead of time. Having a story at the ready is better than coming up with something on the fly. If at all possible, don't go alone. You, you can also use your partner as an excuse if you need to leave early. They can also help identify a triggering situation. If you need to, slip out the back door. It's much better to explain why you left the next day than why you have to leave when you're there. Announce your intended early departure at the beginning. Tell people you don't plan to stay long, and then if everything goes well, you get to stay longer. Always have somebody on standby. If you think you might need somebody to talk to, give them a heads up before you go out. Most people would be happy to take your call and talk you down out of a situation. There are many other things you can do, but whatever you do this holiday season, please stay safe and have a happy holiday, everybody. I'd like to speak to you tonight a little bit about Maine's Good Samaritan Law. This law prevents a person from being arrested or prosecuted for certain violations if the grounds for that arrest or prosecution result from the person experiencing a drug-related overdose or seeking medical assistance for someone who is. Please join us and our partners in trying to affect change in this law. We need to expand the protections for people as well as the number of people. We strongly believe that everybody should carry Narcan. Whether you use or not or know someone who does, you never know when you might come across a situation where somebody's life is in jeopardy. Having this life-saving medication can make all the difference. There needs to be no reason for someone not to call 911 for an overdose. You can email me or join our group, Recovery on the Road, to find out how you can help and get involved. We strongly feel that everybody should be trained in carrying Narcan. You never know when you might come across a situation where this life-saving medication can make the difference. First, dial 911. You don't have to tell them that someone has overdosed. Tell them that your friend is unresponsive and that you're assisting. Next, give two rescue breaths and then administer naloxone. It's always good to wait two to three minutes between doses. But if necessary, you can always give rescue breaths until help arrives. If you or someone you know is at risk of an opiate-related overdose, please carry Narcan. If you don't know anyone at risk, you can still carry Narcan. That's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you so much for joining us on our first episode of Recover Loud. We look forward to seeing you next time bringing you more guests to tell you more stories and share more resources and information. Please stay safe out there. Much more. I call you pick up the phone and always reminding me that I'm not alone and even when I'm scared and my feet are frozen you help me keep it going like a semicolon so I'ma follow your steps for all of the way I put my faith in you and walk on the waves and if I stumble a bit and fall on my face you come and save me with all of your grace yeah thank God